Okay, can everyone hear me all right? Okay, perfect. I mean, um, we have to get started. Um, uh, so I'll start with an introduction. We have now 24 participants in total, but we have over 100 registrations. So we're going We expect a few more people to join at least. Um, so first of all, I'd like to welcome you to the Data Science London Meetup. I'm pretty exciting to be organizing this event. Uh, this meetup has been dead for a long time and then COVID struck and this didn't really help uh, with meetups in general and it looks like COVID and social distancing might be here for some time so I decided to revive the meetup in an online format and apparently it was a good decision because we already have a good crowd with us. Uh, so data science is a vast topic and the community on meetups, uh, I'm not, I know some, some of you might have found this from Eventbrite, but we also have a meetup community and the community is over a thousand two hundred members and it includes people with all kinds of backgrounds from people that are data scientists, people that want to become data scientists or people that have to work with data scientists but have no technical knowledge themselves and this meetup really has something for uh, everyone. Uh, and here's the link for those of you who, uh, I'm also gonna be sharing this on the chat room shortly, for those of you who also wanna become part of the meetup group. And our goal is for this meetup to become alive once again, and we're planning to be hosting regular events, maybe on a quarterly basis to start with, uh, with some other satellite events in between. And a few words about who I am and why I'm organizing this meetup. I'm a data scientist, in case you haven't figured this out yet. I've been in this area for a long time. Um, I'm uh, involved in various projects. Um, I'm doing some traditional data science work, like research and development, algorithm development. But I'm also teaching in some universities. I have advisory positions. Um, and I've also written up a book called The Decision Maker's Handbook to Data Science. Even as it is interested in this, uh, it's essentially a handbook for uh, those who want to learn how to work with data scientists in an organization without being data scientists themselves. And, um, it's, uh, and if you just want to, to get a free copy, feel free to email me after the event. You can learn more about me from a website. And there are a few other events I'm organizing besides the Data Science London Meetup. Uh, I will upload some of these on the Meetup page as well. And feel free to join. Um, I'll be sharing the details in the chat room as well. So this is the program for today. Uh, we're going to start with Joshua. Uh, we'd really like to have Joshua with us. Uh, he lives in Japan. Uh, we know it's a very big challenge for him to be, to be with us today because right now in Japan it's around 1 a.m. Uh, so thank you, Joshua, for being with us. Um, Joshua is going to give a presentation that's more on the technical side. He's going to talk about transformers in natural language processing. Then Eleftheros J. Flores, uh, he, he's a bit late, uh, he's been having some challenges today, we hope he's going to join us. If he joins us, he's going to talk about the impact of AI and data science in business. Um, uh, Eleftheris Flores is a technologist, so he does his own research and he's also a published author on topics as to how blockchain and AI are disrupting society and the economy. Then Tarek Amr, he's going to talk about the co-dependencies between software engineers and data scientists. It's a very interesting presentation. I'm looking really forward to it because it's in this intersection between data science and the technical parts of data science and the software parts relating to management processes, etc. This is an area I am personally very passionate about. And finally, Kyriakos Pavlou, he has joined us from Electric Consulting, and he's going to talk about a very exciting blockchain solution. The format is 10 to 15 minutes presentation uh, plus a QA. and a um, As you understand, running a, an event on Zoom can be uh, challenging in some ways. So I'd kindly ask you to be on mute while the speaker is presenting. Once the speaker concludes, if you have any questions for the speakers, there's going to be around a five minutes slot for question. Please type your question in the chat room and then I will moderate uh, the panel. All right, so you can type a question and then I will ask the speaker to answer your question, etc. So we make sure that we avoid people speaking on top of one another. So uh, that being said, let's start. 
Uh, this is also recorded, just so you know, and I'm going to be uploading this on the data scientist.com and YouTube. So anyone can also join and view it if they've missed anything. Um, so that being said, uh, let's start. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll kindly also ask Joshua to share his screen and presentation and we can get started. All right. Thank you, Mr. Kampikis. Good afternoon, everybody. Even though it's almost 1.15 a.m. in Tokyo. Anyways, nice to meet you all. I'm Joshua Cage, NLP researcher and a data scientist at the Japanese Dix Mining Company. So today, I'm gonna play my pre-recorded video so that I can concentrate on my QA session. So please note that if you have any questions, please type your questions to the chat box while my presentation. In the QA session, I will answer your questions from the chats as many as possible. Now let me start the video. Okay, can you see my video? Uh, my family, especially my... Okay. Hi there. Thank you very much for having me as a presenter in London Data Science 2021 virtual meetup. By the way, do you like Sesame Street? Uh, my family, especially my three-year-old daughter, loves it. So today, I'm going to talk about the transformer-based deep learning approach in an NLP field. There are so many popular methods named after Sesame Street characters like Elmo, Bird, Ernie. But today, we're going to take a close look at the Big Bird. Before talking about the Big Bird, let me introduce myself for a bit. I am Joshua Cage, data scientist, researcher, programmer of an NLP software company in Asia. NLP here stands for Natural Language Processing. I'm pretty sure that I'm very excited and delighted to share our knowledge about the Transformer and the Big Bird. And I'll leave you several links of my materials on Kindle, YouTube, Udemy, and Teachable in the slides. So please access and check if you like my presentation. Now, let's talk about the Big Bird. In one sentence, Big Bird in NLP is a transformer-based retrained model better at handling longer sequences than Bird. If you are new to NLP or machine learning, this sentence might be a little confusing. So let's break it down and figure it out one by one in order. What is Transformer? Transformer is an excellent deep learning architecture which exceeds RNN, which stands for the Recurrent Neural Network, and the CNN, which stands for Convolutional Neural Network, both in NLP and image processing field. It was actually proposed in the paper titled Attention is All You Need in 2017 by Googler and research group in Toronto University. And the transformer is composed of encoder on your left side and decoder on your right side. And also three key elements are the positional encoding for the context embeddings and the multi-head attention and the feed for neural network. And it's good at solving the sequence to sequence tasks such as translation, uh, summarization and question answering. And it was adopted in Google's BERT which is very famous pre-trained model and which also makes Transformer very famous. A Transformer is a game changer. If you take a look at the modern history of NLP and image processing, we could notice that most of the recent SOTA that's or state of the art was achieved by the Transformer-based pre-trained model. If you take a look at the NLP history, then before the Transformer's appearance, RNN, which stands for the Recurrent Neural Net, was thought to be the best choice for sequence-to-sequence -sequence task. But after Transformer was proposed, Bird, Ernie, Big Bird have been breaking records in LMP benchmarks. They are all stacked Transformer-based pre-trained model. There are countless variants of birds, such as lightweight version of Bird, Albert, or Distilled Bird, or which expression can be acquired by the Excel Net or Electra and Robata. In image recognition field, 
On the other hand, CNN was thought to be the best choice until the last year, when Vision Transformer had appeared and pro proven that the pure transformer-based model could get the higher accuracy with less cost than CNN. Also, there is very interesting pre-trained model in between NLP and image recognition field. Uh, it's proposed by the OpenAI GPT 3.0 based Dole E. And if you type text, then the Dole E can generate images from that text corresponding to text very precisely. We could say that now is the transformer era. Okay, now let's get down to the pre-trained language model. What is the language model? Language model is probability distribution over strings of text. So for example, let's say you have two sentences, x1 and x2. x1 is, Elmo is riding on the tricycle. x2, tricycle are Elmo and is. Both x1 and x2 are composed of same vocabularies or words. But x1 is more language-like like sentence, right? If you are an English speaker, then you could agree on that, right? If you want your computer to predict such probabilities, then you need the language model. In history, so we tried a rule-based or dictionary-based language model, but spoken language varies or changes over generations. So it's quite hard to maintain such massive dictionaries. Then we tried the n-gram based probabilistic model, which you basically count the number of appearance of the chunks of the words, but we need to consume a gigantic size of memory to keep such n-gram matrix, since the combination of words is limitless. And then we had a neural network based approach such as word to deck which can learn from a word or co-occurrence of a certain window size and convert from words to vector representations. And it's based on the idea that you shall know a word by the company it keeps. It's a famous quote from the famous linguist, John Rupert Firth. A word to deck fast text glove can capture the meaning representation only by a certain window size. In other words, they only look at the part of a sentence. So that's a limitation of these methods. Then RNN was proposed. RNN-based pre-trained models such as ELMO, which is composed of the stacked bidirectional LSTM, could handle whole sentence considering the order of the sentence. But the computational cost of RNN is relatively high it needs to input the token one by one. Now, the transformer appeared. Transformer-based approach can handle a whole sentence at a time by means of the self-attention-based approach. In pre-trained language model, the transformer era is also coming, okay? Now, last but not least, let's take a look at the benefit of Big Bird compared to Bird. Here is the comparison between Bird and Big Bird in summary. The biggest difference from the business side is that the Bird can only deal with less than 512 tokens. So if you input the longer sentences than 512 tokens, then Bird needs to trim that sentence. But Big Bird can deal with more than 4096 uh, words or tokens which is a very excellent and it is is the very big benefit over the bird and it can be done by the attention mechanism's difference bird have to calculate hold the full attention and the, the computational cost of this calculation is quadratic but big bird is using the random attention the window attention and global attention and it's a mixture of these uh, attentions. It's a sparse attention model. That's why it's a very uh, memory friendly. And it can be applicable to genomics. The big birds uh, sparse attention can make it possible to handle with the DNA data. 
So for example, the benchmark shows that chromatin profile detection can also be done by the big bird. And the big bird is better at handling the longer text, so it's good at summarization tasks or the question and answering tasks of the long sentences compared to the bird. Okay, these are quick summary, quick overview of the comparison between bird and big bird. Okay, as a conclusion, big bird in NLP is a transformer-based pre-trained language model better at handling longer sequences than bird. Do you now get the meaning of this sentence? I have explained what is Big Bird and why Big Bird is very important from the research perspective. So now let's dive into this possible business application of Big Bird. The three main tasks that Big Bird does best are as follows. Summarization, question answering, and translations. The business application of summarization, question answering, and translation, for example, are online meeting summarizer, FAQ system, and real-time translation systems, which will save your time dramatically. Due to time constraints, I only talk about online meeting summarizer today. If this meeting were offline without recording, then I'm afraid I wouldn't attend this meeting in the first place, because I'm living in Japan. But let's assume all the presenters are living in UK, and consider the time it would take for 10 absentees to get the same amount of information after this event. We would have to rearrange the conference room where we would have this meeting and physically gather together in that place to hold this event again, which might take 20 hours. Let's say 2 hours times 10 people considering the transportation and the presenter's preparation time. We are now having this meeting using Zoom, right? Now the organizer of this event is kindly recording each speaker's presentation. If it's online event with recording like right now, then each absentee just needs to play the YouTube video later. It will take 10 hours only, one hour for one absentee each. Actually, recorded talk can be easily recognized and converted into the text using today's speech recognition technique like Amazon Alexa, Google's Cloud Speech, IBM Watson, Microsoft Cortana, whatever speech recognition system you use, the accuracy is now almost as high as human being can do. Speech recognition text of one hour presentation will be a bit too long, and it will take a lot of time to read and comprehend. We will still need 15 minutes for each person, 6 hours and 20 minutes in total. Okay. Now, long text summarization used to be very challenging because it's even much harder for computers to represent one hour representation text in vector space. However, today's Big Bird made it possible to make such representations. Now, each absentee only needs to read the key point of the event by reading the summary text for, say, six minutes each. It will only take one hour for 10 people. We could succeed in reducing the 95% of the time compared to the offline event without recording. Isn't that awesome? If you are new to NLP or deep learning technology, then these links might be helpful for starters. Please access the link and check that out. I hope you see you there. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Here is the QA part, but I don't see any questions from the chat text. So I just introduced the links in the chat, chat text. Probably here is the most important information for the attendees today. This is the first link, the Udemy's course. Here is a free coupon link of my online deep learning course, the PyTorch deep learning from Zero to Hero course at Udemy. So you can start from simple perceptron concept to be able to implement the Google's BERT and the Google's T5. So you can even implement your own summarization application using a Google's T5 by taking this course. This is a five hour course. And this coupon is only valid for three days. So please register the course before the coupon code expires. And hopefully I'll see you there.
Okay, I got the. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, it looks like yeah. there's a question. Uh, how, uh, so yeah, how does text summarization compare to GPT-3 and switch transformers? Okay, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was, actually the big birds, the key concept is the attention, the sparse attention mechanisms. And the sparse attention mechanism can be applicable to GPT-3 as well. Actually, GPT-3 is a full, full attention based pre-trained model. And GPT-3 has so uh, large parameters, but Big Bird can be also applicable to GPT-3 and maybe it, it will be GPT-4 or something like that. Uh, does that make sense? Okay, the second question. Is Big Bird's implementation and pre-trained model already available in libraries? Uh, actually, uh, the answer is no. I, I'm waiting for the hugging face to yeah, release the Big Bird uh, implementation. But you, you can download the source code from the GitHub and yeah, probably you can use uh, GCP to uh, test the code. Great. Any other questions? Um, okay. Well, it looks like there are no more questions. Uh, thank you, Joshua. Very interesting presentation. Uh, and uh, oh, there's one more question. Are there any research papers published? Uh, yeah, it yeah. published in the New Rips, maybe. I, I forgot the name of the global conference, but you can search by typing the Google and Big Bird. If you just type the Big Bird, then the Sesame Street Big Bird will appear. But you type Google and NLP and Big Bird, then you can search the research paper. Yeah, this is this is it. Yeah, I believe this Thank is the you. paper for anyone mm -hmm. interested. Obviously, all research is published. Uh, yeah, I think this is, um, I mean, natural language processing is one of the hottest areas in, in AI and what I personally find fascinating is how fast it progresses. Um, so now we have GPT-3, now maybe next year we'll have GPT-4. Um, now it seems that attention has dominated the space. Who knows what's going to be the mechanism that's going to dominate um, research in one or two years. Could be transformers, could be something else. Uh, but thank you, Joshua. I think this was very insightful. Um, and I hope that... Uh, ever and I think it was kept on a good level, not not too technical, so everyone can really understand what transformers are about. And thank you again for being with us uh, from Japan. I understand that uh, with the time difference, it's it's not that easy for you. Uh, it's probably around half past one or so a.m. over there. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Great. Uh, good, good night. <laughs> good night. I think you deserve some rest. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank uh, you. So thank you, bye bye. So unfortunately, it looks like Lefteris is being held up. We we're not sure if he can actually make it. Uh, still waiting. Um, and given the circumstances, uh, Tarek, um, I, uh, would you like maybe to be the next speaker? Um, I'm gonna put myself on mute. Uh, you can share your screen. I've enabled screen sharing, so you can get started whenever you feel like it. Yeah, sure. Uh... Yeah, uh, so my name is Tarek. Today I want to talk about uh, two different cultures like software engineering culture and machine learning engineering culture. And I call them cultures for a reason. Uh, first, I, yeah, there's the, the term past dependent. It's usually used in the, in the field of economics and mainly history of economics and it mainly means that when you have two groups of people uh, over time each of them get exposed to different historic events and consequently they also take different action and in the field of economics they say like after this past dependent like this actions they take they end up having different uh, economies and today I'm trying to argue that the same applies for also software and machine learning engineers because they are two different groups. They went through different history 
basically their age in the industry, their team sizes, their incentives. And this ended up having two different kind of uh, groups having different cultures. Um, so, uh, yeah, to explain that, I have to go a little bit in history. So, in the, by the late part of the 20th century, uh, we started to see the role of product managers. Uh, they were almost everywhere in every software company, they have to be a product manager. And their role started to be like understanding the business and the customer needs. Uh, and based on that, they write user stories, which explain actually what are the customer needs. And from there, software developers take the stories and try to implement them. And this had two effects. One effect is that the software developers were a bit divorced from the business because there's one layer between them and the business. Uh, the other effect was that they were able to focus more on the engineering part of their role. Uh, so they are having predefined and like well-defined stories. What are the customer needs? Uh, so for them, the, the main role is actually to implement that need. And if you think of uh, engineers from the point of view of civil engineers, for example, when they build a bridge, they don't really, they don't have a room for experimentation because basically when they build the bridge, they know what are the best practices and they use it to build the bridge. And somehow similar, culture happen, like similar effect happen in also in software. That, and that's why actually we use the term software engineer because they apply engineering practices and to name few are like code reviews and, and unit tests and all this stuff. The other group I'm talking about today is the machine learning engineers. Uh, their history is quite different because they started and I would say their history is intertwined with data analysts and business analysts and different parts of the, of, the, of the organizations. And because of that, when they started, they're also, they were used to getting business requests all the time, like business questions, like business stakeholders ask them uh, what is affecting our revenue, how can we analyze the growth and stuff like that. Of course, when they end up and when they turn into building machine learning models, their relation with the business and the users was still there. And because of that, they, I would argue that they also always, when they build code, uh, although they are not the best at writing software, like compared to software engineers, but they are more focused on outcome or like business uh, impact more than code quality sometimes even. Uh, and in a way you can see it also in how they uh, deal with data. For example, software engineers, uh, because they want to write uh, lean and scalable code, when they store data, they only store the data they need now and today. Uh, machine learning engineers, they almost always understand that the data sometimes is more valuable than the algorithms they use. And because of that, when they collect data, they don't only care about data that they need now, but they care about data that they might need uh, 18 months from now or something. And yeah, this is one example. A second example, which is also uh, for me shows this uh, division between the two or like how the way of thinking is the term testing. So if you use this, the term testing and tell a software engineer, what do you understand from this term? they will usually say it's about unit testing and test-driven development and integration testing and all these kind of things. And this is about testing how the code performed compared to the predefined user story or predefined user needs. And you can think of them as a musician in a classical music or Western classical music. So basically the musician then the role is to play the same notes Beethoven intended to be played. So when they are testing all the software, they wanted to exactly do what the user story intended it to be. In Eastern music or even jazz sometimes, uh, the performer is also the composer. So when they play music, sometimes they involve the audience with them. Sometimes based on the audience feedback, they change the music they are playing. 
And that's also how uh, testing is kind of different in the machine learning uh, field, because mostly testing is about testing the effect of what we build on the user. And either A-B experimentation or splitting the data into training and test, which is basically we try to uh, predict how the user or how the data will be or how the user behavior will be. So it's basically we don't really test how the quality of the code, but more testing the, the effect of the code on the end user. And even sometimes uh, machine learning engineers end up writing buggy code, but if by the chance they were able to prove that there's a business outcome, like a positive business impact, they might deploy it while it's buggy. So it has a, a pros and cons here. Um, but this is not gonna stay forever. And I think you have noticed that I'm using a GitHub uh, a logo, uh, image here. So what I was talking about is like, there were like two different cultures and they were like, there's kind of uh, forking, like Git fork. And now the two cultures are gonna merge together. And this is a bit opinionated from my side, but I believe that in the next five years, there will not be anything like machine learning engineers. This term might actually disappear and we will only have engineers. Some of them write front end, some of them write back end. Some of them also write code that use Hugging Face or Transformer or PyTorch or TensorFlow, which is basically machine learning, but they are again engineers. Actually, I have a friend called uh, Noel Kippers and he like, like to call this putting on your big boy pants, basically like uh, adopting the engineering uh, part of the job of writing machine learning. Uh, but here comes my fear, like when this happens, when the two culture merges, uh, what I see that maybe 10% of the companies and mostly the companies you guys all know about like Google, Facebook, like the big names, in those companies, they still, uh, whether software or machine learning engineers, they all adopt the, the spirit of, uh, of lean startup and they do build measured learn and they learn and, and try to, even engineers, their role is not really writing code, but their role involves also coming up with business ideas all the time. And if you, yeah, if you read any book by CEO of uh, Netflix, they will always say that engineers role is to yeah, understand the business and come up with ideas. But my fear here is about the 90% of the companies, like the rest of the, uh, of the businesses, uh, where still engineering and in the term of software engineer is still uh, divorced from the business. And I am afraid that when we merge the two roles, like machine learning engineers and software engineer, we will lose what we learn from uh, from machine learning or in the term of iteration and MVPs. And we will end up having more culture where people who execute the code don't really know the business and don't really care about the business. And yeah, that's, that's more of an open question. And yeah, as you see, like this is a bit opinionated the uh, presentation today. Um, Hi, yeah, now it's time to introduce maybe myself in the last slide quickly. Thank you, I'm uh, doing good. Before opening for questions. So my name is Tarek Amr, I'm based in the Netherlands. Um, I wrote a book uh, this summer was published called Hands-on Machine Learning with Scikit-Learn. It's basically about yeah, building, soft, uh, building machine learning models with Scikit-Learn. I work in a ticket swap, which is a second-hand ticketing company here in the Netherlands. Uh, but again, I was like saying this presentation is opinionated for a reason because I want to really get the feedback of everyone. And that's why I'm asking, I'm maybe making some controversial uh, points here because based on this feedback, I might decide to expand it into a third book of mine, like about how these cultures are changing and how the business can really use machine learning or what we learn from machine learning which in my opinion is a short lived field that is gonna disappear soon, but at least we should keep what we learn from it uh, going forward. And that's it. And yeah, I'd like to open the floor for 
for the question. Great, thank you, Tarek. This was a great presentation, very interesting. And I see we already have um, a question by MB. Maybe you'd like to, to answer. Yeah, one sec. So uh, yeah, MB is asking, uh, is, there, is there any future for software engineering? Because now everyone now looking for ML and data science. Well, actually my opinion is actually the opposite of the question. So the question is asking, is there a future for software engineering? And what I believe that actually, no, the two roles will, will, will combine. And I think people have this question a lot, long time ago, like even like, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, whenever we come up with higher level programming language and better tooling, people would think, oh, computer will automate everything and will write code for us. This never happened and I don't think it will ever happen. Uh, people will still need software engineers to write code and to, yeah, to build uh, architecture and everything. Yeah, we can argue that GPT-3 can automate some task for people like writing uh, front end uh, or CSS, but those are mostly the stuff that you give to an intern, not, not really the architectural decision that you make. So software engineering will stay, we remain. I think I agree with what you're saying, Tarek. Uh, I don't think a software engineer's job is at risk yet. <laughs> if this is what the question was, uh, was implying. <laughs> Anyone else? Hmm. I'm not sure if there are any more questions. Uh, let's give it a minute in case some people are still thinking about it. Do you have questions yourself? Uh, okay, if there are no more questions, then I guess we can uh, move on. Uh, so thank you, Tarek, for the presentation. Very insightful. Um, and uh, Kiryako, um, I guess you're the next one. So I'm going to mute myself now and I'll let you present. Okay. Uh, so let me just uh, just share my screen. So everyone can see my slides. Is that okay? I'm not sure I can see your slides. No? I personally don't. No. Nope. No? Nope. How about now? I, okay, now you start the screen share. Yes, now we do. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself, thanks. Okay, you just give me one second to move this out of the way. Okay, so um, my name is Kiriagos. Uh, people call me Kiri because it's easier. Um, it's very, um, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Uh, I'm the managing partner and uh, of Electi Consulting and also I'm the director of Electi Academy. So Electi Consulting is a, is a consulting company with uh, branches in London and also in Limassol that specializes in, in emergent tech uh, blockchain, AI, data science, uh, cryptography, and so forth. And I'm also a research associate at the UCL Center for Blockchain Technologies. And today I'll be speaking about a solution that we are developing um, called Naker. And it's, uh, it's a decentralized platform for um, securing uh, cer certificates for uh, seafarers. And it has a lot of, it has great application in the shipping industry. So uh, that's my profile. I'm, I've mostly worked in the academia. My background is in uh, math, CS, and biology, genetics. I'm interested in blockchain and database design. And I've worked with various um, uh, entities uh, with regards to you know, um, uh, consulting, MSC, ship management, Lloyds, and this European Central Bank. So I'm going to give the uh, definition of the problem, what the scope is. We just, it, you know, two slides on blockchain. Most of you, I'm sure you understand what blockchain is. Uh, I'll go over the tech stack of the platform. 
Um, going to a bit of more detail about the functionalities, uh, we'll look at the status and how we plan to move forward. And I'll give um, some brief overview of what the digital landscape is in the maritime industry um, and how blockchain and um, other emergent tech can add value and what is the interaction between blockchain and, and data analytics, okay? Um, so basically the problem we're dealing with here is that when you have a shipping company and you have seafarers, when you do the crewing process, these seafarers need to be certified before they can be accepted on board. So certificates will attest to specific experiences, specialized training and competences of these seafarers. And usually they're uh, issued internally by companies, by shipping companies themselves through their training departments. Uh, there are maritime training institutes, which are third party institutes that uh, deal with these trainings and, uh, and also uh, government authorities. Okay, so uh, a seafarer can have uh, a seaman's book with you know, unique IDs that are issued by the uh, ministries of their respective countries. And you know, the shipping industry is a bit um, conservative in terms of tech adoption. So all these processes of collecting, verifying, submitting documents is done manually and we're talking about hard copies. So this is high friction, but like the entire process has, uh, is very inefficient and has a lot of cost for the companies. So here on the right, you see a sample of such a certificate that, um, you know, it's for advanced firefighting uh, training from, a, from a, an actual training center in Mumbai, in India. So, and this, is, this problem is a prime target for standardization and automation, process automation, and, and even, you know, in the bigger scheme of things of, uh, you know, a business process re-engineering. So in general, at a high level, we can um, identify four main stakeholders, entities that are involved. You have a certificate authority that issues the certificates. As we said, it's a government agency, a shipping company, an MTI. It's a governing body who might be um, a port authority when there is a port call, meaning where it, when a ship actually goes to a port, um, a ministry, uh, and they're responsible for approving these issued certificates and, and uh, you know, they're regulators, they're, uh, they're responsible for giving licenses to, for instance, the MTIs to train people. There is an end user, which is the certificate holder. It, you know, typically it's a seafarer and a, a, a verifier, which is any interested party that needs to verify that these certificates are um, actually authentic. Okay, this could be an, a crewing department inside a, a shipping company. Um, uh, for instance, a captain on a ship, uh, a port authority and so on. So there are several bottlenecks. We did a process mapping of the entire process. There are multiple uh, uh, bottlenecks. And then for now, the solution that we're focusing on that is being deployed is internal to the shipping to a shipping company, um, and the main issue here um, is that there are a lot of certificates. There are a lot of instances where seafarers forge their certificates in order to be crewed, and also there are cases where certificates are invalid, are either expired or are issued by uh, non-licensed MTIs. So this is what we're trying to deal with here. So the solution we have to propose has to be secure. It has to be scalable uh, when it's brought into a, a larger network of, you know, multinational network, you know, multiple countries, multiple authorities, multiple ports, and so on, and so on. And we'll uh, leverage blockchain technologies to uh, address the issue. Okay, so briefly, blockchain became famous because of Bitcoin. There are completely different things. We're talking about uh, a distributed, a shared ledger, a distributed database, a shared ledger that you know, independent entities can establish a consensus on what the state of affairs, the state of the database actually is. 
and they do not rely on a central authority to coordinate this. And specifically, it's designed to uh, operate in an adversarial environment. So you can have actors in the network that are acting in bad faith. So more technically, more formally, so this is, a, you know, I don't know if you've seen this, but, you know, it, it tends to be used a lot. The source is from the, you know, the PDF on uh, blockchain tech by NIST in the US. Um, so it's a ledger of electronic records. You have independent participants that establish a consensus. The, the transactions are cryptographically validated. Um, so they, there is a persistence in the state because the data are uh, replicated across multiple nodes. It's tamper evident by this linking, linking process of the blocks. And um, you have a ledger where it serves as an, uh, an authoritative version of, uh, of the truth, of the state of being. So uh, it has very nice properties that we can use to solve the problem. It's shared record keeping, multi-party consensus. You have independent validation. Anyone can that belongs in the in the network can validate the um, the authenticity of the records. It's tamper evident and it's tamper resistant. So the Naker platform will, will use this um, blockchain to solve this problem. It's built currently on Ethereum blockchain that's running on AWS. Uh, and we're looking into uh, managed solutions, managed blockchain solutions from other vendors like Microsoft Azure. Um, so right now there's uh, a governing body and a certificate authority with a dedicated Ethereum node. And you have the governing body and the certificate authority that use a, a web UI to interact with the blockchain. And for the seafarers, we've developed a, a mobile application, both for iOS and Android, to they can actually you know, have as a wallet where they can store their certificates and prove their identities during the current process. So this is a, a simplified tech stack of the Naker, Naker platform. So you have the, the user from the governing authority that interacts with the blockchain through a, a UI. They can revoke certificates, they can uh, revoke licenses of certificate authorities, and they can actually monitor the certificates themselves. Likewise, you have a certificate authority that issues and revokes certificates. We'll see these functionalities in more detail in subsequent slides. Um, you have a seafarer where we can use a, a mobile app to um, retrieve the certificates from the blockchain and also go through the authentication process, and I'll show that in a bit. And you have the crewing officer we can, we, who can use as their own UI to look at the certificates and make sure you know, and, uh, and authenticates the user when uh, they appear uh, at the office, at the crewing office uh, to be crewed. So right now, there is a, a GB, a governing body that they're um, so they, you need a, a governing body to uh, give license, to give, um, uh, to grant uh, privileges to a certificate authority to issue certificates. So there is a, through the UI, the governing body can register a, a certificate for a shipping company. So uh, what you see here is the UI that we've developed for MSC ship management. So right now, because we don't have a, governan, a governing authority from the government, uh, we are using for GB, the senior executives at MSC. Um, and uh, the CAs are multiple training centers within uh, MSC ship management. So now the CA can have uh, the right to issue certificates. So for, for the CA, they actually issue certificates. There is a separate uh, UI for this. There is a button um that allows them to issue um just to point out that you these large addresses are unique our hashes are unique for each um, certificate authority and uh, entity that's on board on the blockchain and this is how they're uniquely identified on the system so this is how you issue certificates um the typing the the type of the certificate the kind of training they you issue the certificate for determines the fields 
um, the certificate when it's issued is stored on the blockchain and it's immutable. Um, and there is also a process where we can dynamically generate uh, a PDF uh, in case, because you have different MTIs with different de technological readiness levels. So you have to cater to offline solutions as well. So, you know, in cases they need to actually present a physical copy of something. So this is the case here where you see an actual copy of a certificate issued um, by MSC. Um, so you can also revoke a certificate if something goes wrong. And true to the nature of blockchain, once you revoke a certificate, then it cannot be reinstated. It has to be reissued. So for the seafarers, we have developed this app, as I mentioned, so they can gain the to, uh, access to the system through their cell phones. Um, there is a, a tab here that lists the certificates that were issued for that uh, seafarer. And when time comes for the seafarer to be crewed, uh, they have to appear at the crewing offices. Now with COVID is a bit trickier, so we've developed an, you know, an, an online solution for that. So basically what happens there, the crewing officer will issue a challenge in the form of a QR code. Um, the, the seafarer will use their cell phone to uh, scan the QR code, sign it with their keys and send it back. And that's how they are um, authenticated. And so you verify that the actual person in front of you is who they claim to be. So you connect the physical person with the, a, the electronic record of the certificates that are authentic. So right now we run a, a pilot project internally for MSC in Limassol in Cyprus. Uh, that's completely done. And we are in the process of deploying the solution in um, for the two training centers uh, of MSC. And we're starting um, with uh, their training center in Odessa in the Ukraine. And <clears throat> we're also looking of enga to engage other external entities and mainly um, before. So there is a, an MTI that we're um, targeting and also a, a vendor who also issues certificates for um, seafarers that that have, you know, what they undergo uh, training to be able to um, uh, use the, the vendor's uh, equipment. So uh, as I mentioned before, the maritime industry and the shipping industry is not, is a bit conservative in terms of tech uptake. And right now uh, they're beginning to understand that sound business decisions are very important and unless you have you know good data and information uh, that's not really possible so there are many efforts currently and and recently actually the you know past uh, three years four years uh, to establish standards and guidelines for tech adoption in the maritime industry so i'm just listing a bunch here um, for the digital container shipping association uh, port call optimization, that is uh, decision-making guidelines uh, and collaboration efforts from the Research Institute of uh, Sweden called RISE. There is also Pronto. This is a very interesting project at the Port of Rotterdam uh, from the global MTCC network. Uh, because right now it's, you know, it's quite primitive in the sense that it's first come, first serve. There is no actual scheduling of ships. Uh, in terms of how and you know and the exchange of information between ships and the port authorities, and uh, TradeLens, which is the blockchain solution developed by A IBM for supply chain management in collaboration with Maersk, which is the largest uh, shipping company by um, you know currently. I should mention that MSC Ship Management that we work with is the second largest in the world in terms of freight moved. Um, so we cannot overstate the, the value added of using emergent tech um, in general, not just in the maritime industry. So I have a, you know, we, we can discuss this, you know, for hours, but let me just mention that there is a lot of things you can do in terms of 
predictive maintenance, scheduling, um, you know, pricing models, risk, risk models for insurance, uh, and you know, you know, getting you know the appropriate data and doing proper analytics will you know will definitely help all these processes. In terms of AI and machine learning, there is a there are initiatives currently for autonomous vessels uh, in the shipping industry, um, inspection robots that uh, inspect ships and reduce the um, the time required to do these. Um, and also training simulations. And uh, it leads to you know, increased situational awareness. Uh, there is increased safety, reduced response time during you know, uh, security instances and so forth. And for blockchain, um, we saw this, uh, we saw two applications, the one for crewing and uh, the one for supply chain. But also, there is uh, it can be used for cross-border financial transactions, faster payments and settlements, and so forth. So, the 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 main issue to understand here is that if we start looking at the value added and the applications of these, you know, emerging tech, then they exhibit strong interconnections and dependencies. So, improvements in AI affect robotics in terms of ship inspection, maintenance, and autonomous vessels. Improvements in IP data quality, you know, uh, and volume will enhance analytics. Blockchain adoption allows to build logic at a higher layer. Um, so you have robotic process automation, you have better analytics and machine to machine communication, um, not just at the cyber physical level. So they're very desirable, these synergies, because you have accelerating returns. And Maker solves a very specific problem. And I've highlighted, you know, some, you know, added value uh, offered by Naker, and it has it increases the value in different aspects of the value chain. It has a very well defined niche in the maritime tech ecosystem. And in general, just to conclude, uh, the interaction of blockchain and data science is quite important. You have, you know, better uh, trust your data, increased data integrity, quality increased uh, and strengthened uh, data security, um, better analytics, streamlining of big data, facilitating data access and sharing. This allows real-time um, analytics and, and gleaning insights, and of course, cost savings. And with that, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please, I'm all ears. Thank you, Kiriako. Um, I think there is a question by someone. Oh, GBs and CAs technically manage their own mode. Okay. If not, would a more centralized ledger? Okay. Okay. So the idea here is that, uh, okay. So the, as I said, the, the text stack, like the box diagram, that's you know, quite simplified. Um, so what we have here is, uh, they're not going to manage their own minutes. So the, we will be onboarding and dealing with the management of the blockchain platform. So the idea is once you have, a, if you have a system, you know, the net, you know, a system in the platform set up, then you, you approach each individual MTI, each individual vendor, each individual shipping company, and or crewing services and you onboard them it requires uh, some you know some um groundwork for from our side to onboard them but after that once you have a you know especially if you go to a fully managed solution that uh, uh, some of the big cloud vendors are, are you know deploying these days are offering so like amazon web services does have their own um Managed solution with blockchain, but they don't they don't support Ethereum right now. They will, but they they haven't actually said when yet. But Microsoft Azure does offer these kinds of um, uh, managed solutions for blockchain. And and you have so when you go into production, it's yes there are issues. Uh, you know there are you know there are issues with robustness. 
you know, end the amount of uh, of transactions you can do on on blockchain. Yes, that's a that's a big issue. Performance is a big issue. Thank you, Kiriako, for the answer. Uh, are there any more questions? If there are no more questions, um, I have one, uh, and more specifically about uh, where do you see the, uh, the future uh, of, uh, of blockchain and uh, in, in, in shipping, and more specifically, whether you believe that, uh, I think you, you mentioned something like this in your presentation, but maybe you can elaborate on this, on uh, how do you see AI and other technologies like IoT integrating with, um, with, with blockchain? Okay, so the blockchain will it's it's a it's a very nice layer that will provide you with you know good quality data. Um, and then you can start building on top of that in terms of you know the higher layers, you know, the logic. So ideally you you want to go fully automated. So you will have you can deploy sensors on ships. You can grab all these sensors, you know, you know, you know, you can put them, whether it's blockchain or some kind of, you know, distributed rep repository that's to be decided. Um, but then once you do that, then you can start looking into machines talking to each other and making decisions. So you don't, you won't even need crewing services in the sense that what you what 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 ideally is going to happen is that you will say the machine will say I need to make this schedule for uh, this specific route for this specific ship type. I need this kind of crew members with these kinds of certificates, uh, these kinds of competences. Then once this is decided, then you know the machine can actually go through and look at the, the active seafarers that someone has uh, in their database, in their crewing database. And depending on availability, they can actually do it automatically and say this person and filter automatically. This person is, uh, you know, is, can be crewed or not. So once you have this, then you can do analytics and you can do prediction because it's very, so it's something I didn't mention, but um, you need to be able to schedule your uh, your routes in um, the, the routing of the of the ships, so that uh, you know you make specific port calls, so you can uh, so so you know crew members can uh, disembark and new uh, crew members can um, you know be crewed and embark the ship. So this thing has to be coordinated and <clears throat> and also you have to as i said you know predictive maintenance uh, you need to be able to um, you know schedule when these things will take place so uh, you know the short answer is you this is a very good foundation like blockchain in lo logistics supply chain crewing and so forth will allow you to build you know a logic layer above it through data science, AI, and um, and other you know machine learning, so that the the whole process is automated and it's very streamlined. So essentially, it's about making things more seamless and and, and easier. Yes, low friction, and also if you have ecosystems, <clears throat> so these kinds of ecosystems unlock value. So you have mm -hmm. network effects. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you, Kiriakos. Um, so unfortunately, Lefteris, um, he couldn't make it today. Uh, there were some uh, unpredictable circumstances. Uh, hopefully he can be with us in, uh, in a future meetup. Uh, so thank, thanks everyone. Uh, Joshua is the... Oh no, actually, wait. Lefteris is here. I <laughs> think he mixed up the time. <laughs> Lefteris J, are you with us? Sorry.
let's give him a second. Uh, yeah, I guess sometimes you can predict um, what the life is going to throw at you, uh, especially during an online event. Okay, let's wait for a couple more minutes and to see what the lefters can, can present. Yeah, I'm not sure what's happening. Um, I think there might just be some uh, unforeseen circumstances. Let's like start to connect, but um, I think he's not here. Um, so I guess what we're going to do is probably, oh, he's here. Okay. Steady. I'm so sorry. I'm really, really sorry. I, 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 I was on the tube and I uh, tried to come home, and I'm really sorry. Uh, no worries. These things happen. Uh, <laughs> the good thing is that most participants are still here, like 90% of our audience. So feel free to start your talk whenever you, you're ready. I mean, I try to. Uh, I, you know, I try to. Uh, 
make it on uh, five o'clock and uh, and we talked uh, this morning and uh, I didn't make it, so I'm, I'm really sorry. By the way, you look like you're like, like in a racing car <laughs> with your with your with your with your. Uh, it's a gimmick chair, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's a gimmick chair, but there's a reason behind this. These are by far the best chairs for uh, back pain. So the reason is not that I'm playing video games all night. That's, <laughs> if this is what you're expecting to hear from me, you'll be disappointed. <laughs> it looks like it, it looks like it, it looks like you're like playing like video games. You know? <laughs> no, I, I wish I had the time to play video games. I don't. <laughs> so that's what he wants. He, he wants us to believe. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, guys. I just have back pain. Uh, at least this is what I. Why do we can you see me right now? Life. Because I don't know if you can see me. I, you know. I, I see you, but I can't. No, we can't see you. Going? We only see your photo. We can't see your camera. What? One second. Uh, share your camera so we can see your gaming. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm so sorry. I, uh, I, you told me about it and, and, and I texted you because you said let's uh, talk uh, before and I wanted to talk because I wanted to prepare myself a little bit beforehand and, and, and get it uh, but I just uh, I just couldn't make it. I'm so sorry. I really... Uh, oh, no worries. I think we're pretty much on schedule with some small delays. So if you want to get started, I think we can also finish pretty much on schedule. Um, and they also the session is recorded. So I guess you can also see... Um, uh, you can see you know, the presentations you missed. Uh, if you want to share your screen, if you have a deck of slides, I, can, I have enabled multiple participants sharing. So you can just uh, share your screen whenever you're ready. All right, I, I, I don't have any slides. Um, I, um, I just, um, I send you a text about uh, data science. So for me, I see, I work with, uh, uh, First I'm sorry, maybe you'd like, oh yeah, that's true, sorry. So uh, maybe you'd like to share with the audience what's the topic then of, of the talk. Yes, I forgot it's not a set of slides, but it's more of a, of a talk. Yes. Um, so I um, work with a lot of startups and a lot of startups, you know, they talk about um, data science. They talk about, it's like this buzzwords about data science, about, you know, we're going to incorporate data science. We're going to use... Uh, artificial intelligence, we're gonna use analytics to, to get further and uh, use it in our business. The thing that I realized with a lot of those startups that I work with is that the notion is there, the buzzwords is there, but a lot of, a lot of startups don't really realize what, how to incorporate it and to do it properly. Because it's different just to talk about it and it's different to actually in, implicate it and implement it to, to do what you want to do with the data science. So you have a lot of startups that are trying their best to get started in this in this new science, but it's not really working out. And I always tell them, I said, you know, if you don't have the right approach, if you don't get the right data to, to use it, you're not gonna get much further. You need to find what is it that you're looking for that you wanna get ahead with, what you wanna use in your business. So a lot of people think that uh, we're just gonna say, you know, artificial intelligence, we're gonna use analytics, we're gonna use big data to, to create a new platform. It's like, what is it that you wanna create? What is it that you wanna get out of it? Especially for FinTech companies. And I'll give you one example. If you look at Amazon e-commerce, Amazon is just incredible when it comes to using data science, analytics, using artificial intelligence, using all the data that people want to use to give a better experience. So for example, if you go on Amazon platform, before you even get on their platform, you have to sign in, you have to give your name, you have to sign up and say what you, you know, what's your, uh, uh, what your account is. And from that moment on, everything is recorded. How long you look at a certain product, service, how, what interest you have, why you look at it, what's, what's behind it. And that information, 
they use to give you more recommendation. And that's why Amazon has this recommendation engine that when you want something, they analyze it and they give you recommendations about what you might like, what you might wanna buy, what you might wanna do. So Amazon has this incredible use of data science to, to, to make their service and product better. And you see that also in financial services. In financial services, you see banks, the challenger banks, they use that information to give you also a better a review of what products or services they're selling. But a lot of them don't have this level of sophistication and attention to detail like Amazon does. And that's where people that are in data science come in. That's where you come in because the information that you get is what makes a difference and how you process it is what makes a difference. It's not about getting all this data, just accumulating all this data and thinking, okay, well, that's that's what we want to use. It's how you in, implement that data to create a better service. So with the startups that I work with, a lot of those startups, that I, I sit to them and so, say, okay, we have all this information about this, that, whatever. What are you going to do with that data? How are you going to use it? And that's why when I receive feedback from, from customers, you know, they, they, they understand what you're trying to do, but what's the bottom line? How are you making a difference in their life? What are you doing with this data that you're providing them? Because all of us, we use all kinds of services, but what kind of, what, what gets done with the data that we provide them? In Google search, it's quite simple. You look at something and Google gives you that free information. But in other apps, especially finance apps, fintech apps, the information that you provide is the, the, the information that they can use to make the service better. And right now, I have like a couple of fintechs that I work with, and I realized that the, the service that they can provide can be improved dramatically if only they would apply the right criteria, what to do with that information that people are providing them free of charge. And that's where I think data science comes in. And that's why I believe that data science is not something arbitrary. Data science is something that professional people like you, the Celia and us and other people that know about it, know what to do, what to do with structured and non-structured data, what to do with data that is provided from the customer and how to process it and to make something more out of it. So for me, it's not about just a buzzword, it's about how can you use that data to actually create a better service or a product. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Uh, so I think this was uh, this was an, an, an insightful um, comment, and I think it's I guess what what um, I guess to summarize what you, the opinion you wanted to essentially share with us is that uh, it's not just about the data or the technology itself, but how you can use this to make a better product or or service. Um, correct. That's the whole idea. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I know that uh, unfortunately you, you missed them, the presentation of Kyriakos that's like the blockchain space because I know that you're an influencer in this space in London in, in blockchain. And uh, I, I, I had the, the, the chance to also uh, read your book recently uh, where you're talking about amongst many other things where you see uh, how you see blockchain and AI um, working synergistically with the lockdowns and everything we're experiencing right now. Um, to fast track some changes in the economy. And I just wanted to maybe ask you to, uh, you know, to, to, to share a few, uh, let's say a short summary, because we have to conclude in like five minutes or so, but if you could share a short summary um, or an opinion about that. So like, how do you see all these things converging right now, all the changes we see in society with these changes in technology and 
what do you think is going to be, let's say, the, the key uh, impact, if you had to summarize it in one, two or three bullet points? Well, I, I, I f f firmly believe that uh, data science is going to make a big difference. Why? Again, we come back to the Amazon uh, sample. Uh, what you want is when you go on an app or a platform, you want to be able to use it and it, you want it to be made easy for you. So now if you have a platform or an app that analyzes your behavior, your online behavior, and gives you that what you want to look for instead of what they want to beam at you, makes all the difference in the world because we all don't have the time to sit here and, and, and sit there and, and try to figure out what we want to do on a platform. When you go on the platform, you want to be able to use that information that is available, the information that you are providing to the platform to get a better service. So if I go on Amazon, for example, and I look for a finance book, I want Amazon to tell me, well, you know, these are the books that you're looking at. These are the ones that are interesting to you. If you look at a challenger bank, you want the same, the same thing. You want, if you're looking at stocks, trading or investments, you want to look at what's there, what is something that you're interested in. Is it ecological, sustainability, whatever? And that information is provided to you. And that makes the platform interesting because if they do it properly, you're not bombarded with all this information that you don't really use. For example, I use trading platforms. I use, for example, IG trading. And you have like these indicators, these financial indicators. I'm talking about 170 different indicators. And because I studied at the London Academy of Trading and I know how to use it, I know what to look for. But here comes the difference. If you go on a platform where somebody tells you, well, this is the information that we have. This is what you're looking for. This is the, the interest that you are having. This is what you, what you want to know about. It makes it for you easier. And that makes all the difference in the world. And that's why I believe the most important thing for any app or platform is simplicity. Let the technology work in the background. Let the science work in the background. If you do it properly, data science, if you do it properly, artificial intelligence, if you do it properly and it works in the background, people don't even realize that they're using it. It comes to the point when right now, if you wanna write an email, it's self-populating. Your email on Gmail actually tells you what should you reply, what, you, what should you say? And this automation, this simplifying of tasks make it easier for somebody to get involved in any kind of platform. And from a financial point of view, from the FinTech aspect, when you look at that, that's what makes platforms so successful. They give you ideas about what you're looking for without you having to analyze and research of course, it's always good to realize and to analyze what, you, what you're looking for, but it's important that all this information that's coming at us is condensed to the point that you can absorb it and you can make something out of it. So if you come from a simple point of view where you want to be involved in fintech, if you are online banking, you just want simple information, you know, what what, what does your account provide? What, what information do you need? If you are a trader in FinTech and you want to trade stocks, you want the information that's available simplified to the point that you understand it. So in trading, it's a big positive to use analytics, to use AI, to use all the information that comes at you and distill it to the point that you can use it for what you want to do. And if you're trading, you want that information available at a click of a button. So I think in the future, it's going to be that way. And I think there's a lot of potential, but I tell all the FinTech startups that I work with, 
you need to employ the right people to know what you're talking about because you need to analyze the information that you want to gain and the information that you want disseminated. You want people to know what is it, the information that you that is given by the participants, by the people that sign up to your platform and how you're gonna use it to the benefit of the user. Because now if you do something, if you look at Google, that information is used to sell advertisements. But if you would do it in a FinTech background, the information that you provide could be used to the benefit of the customer, the customer or the user of your platform. And this is something I think has a big possibility not to think about getting data and have it siloed in silos at the big companies. It's about getting data from your platform users and giving it back to them that they can use it for their benefit. And that I think is gonna be a big major shift in the future that people give their information and even if that they don't get rewarded or paid for it, that information, whatever they want to provide is given back to the customer or to the user of the platform and they can use it to do what, what is to their benefit. Mm -hmm. I see. And I think that there's a comment from one of our speakers, Ketan Varia, who says that questions need answering for the company or the customer and that use data scientists to get to the answers. And I guess, you know, it's all about coming together, right? So I guess what, what you want to say in the end of the day is that um, while we're going to witness more and more uh, greater, more and more automation spreading out through society and through the industry, um, uh, that's, that's important. But at the same time, I guess, and this is what one of our participants want to say, it's also important to make sure you really understand the problem or the challenge and then actually use technology to, to solve this, uh, this challenge. Um, which uh, I guess that's, that's a very relevant comment. And um, this actually uh, brings me to some of the work I've personally been doing advising startups. And um, you know, I've really seen sometimes this divide between where the future, some entrepreneurs or startups uh, think, where, where, where they see the future, where they think everything is heading towards to, but at the same time, what are the actual problems that companies or clients are facing right now? And it's often about making the two uh, meet. Um, so uh, thank you, Jerry, uh, for, your, um, uh, for your talk. And uh, it's good that you managed to make it in, in the end. You talked to me this morning. You told me. And I asked you, you know, I was like, is it four or five? And then you told me that. I'm so sorry. And then I come from the tube. My battery's dead. Yeah. I, I'm rushing home to, to log in to, 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 to do because I I really enjoy this topic. And I um just to tell we will be organizing I... more we will be organizing more events, so don't worry. What I was saying in the beginning is that we're going to be trying to organize some big quarterly events, uh, but maybe also some smaller satellite events or shorter sessions. Um, so that's not in one of for sure, right? So, and, uh, and I hope that also the participants enjoyed this. And something that we've seen with, with the lockdown is that online events can be very successful. And as soon as we get out of the lockdown, maybe we'll start running hybrid events, which are both online and offline, maybe broadcast them and try to include people from other places from all over the world. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you. I'm afraid we have to conclude because we're a bit, um, uh, yeah, we're a bit over time. Uh, but it's great, you know, that we had everyone here today. Um, so yes, I'd like once again to to thank our speakers. Unfortunately, some of the speakers had to go, like Joshua, because he <laughs> he lives in Japan, and it was great he could be with us. I know Tarek also had to go. Um, before I go, I'm just sharing some other events I'm organizing. Um, there's uh, there are a couple of AI and data science clinics, as I call them, happening next month, where you can simply ask if you're a business owner, an entrepreneur, a manager, you can ask any question you want about data science, and I'm going to be there to help you out. There are also some other events on data-driven product development, uh, an event on what it's like to be a data scientist. 
um, and also a workshop on AI and data science for decision makers. Uh, if uh, I'll also be following up with an email with all of you from Eventbrite and, uh, and meetups with those events. And also, as I mentioned, uh, if anyone uh, wants to get, um, uh, get a copy of my book or if they have any comments about the session, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I, sorry, let me share all the details now. Uh, here are the events. And here's my email address. And uh, yes, I hope I'm gonna see all of you in, um, in another session. And I will also be looking for your feedback. You know, we're a very I guess, diverse community in terms of backgrounds. Some people have technical backgrounds, some people have business backgrounds. Some might be working in big corporations. Other people might be uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, so I'd be very curious to hear what you guys want from, from these meetups, from, from this community. Well, what is it that you find most interesting? So Can thank you. Um, say uh, one thing. Yeah, sure. Okay. I don't want to interrupt you because you're doing a, a great speech. Um, I'll tell you honestly, uh, Dr. Kambakis, I, I follow your uh, podcast, I follow your newsletters, I follow your uh, information that you send, uh, your events, your webinars. I actually attended some of your courses. Oh, thank you. And what I enjoy the most, and this is crucial, what I enjoy the most is that you explain things in simple terms. And that's what counts because you, I talk to certain people that are a little bit more academic and they talk in academic terms and you are academic, but you talk in simple terms. You explain what data science is, how it can be used to the benefit of your business. And this is crucial because sometimes you have this academics talking to you and telling you all this data science and, mm -hmm. and, and how to use it and implement it. And you kind of get lost in the words of what is trying to be said. <laughs> I think it's something that happens a lot, yeah. And, and it happens, but it's important when you meet somebody, and I mean it honestly, when, when, I, when I talk to you, it just, you, you make it simple. And that's the whole key thing. Keep it simple, make it simple. And that's how people can use it in their business, that people can understand it. Because data science is exactly that, it's a science but mm -hmm. make it simple, approachable, that people can use it in a business. So on that point, I want to congratulate you because I, I enjoy reading your emails because it makes everything simple, clear to the point. And that's the whole thing about data science. Make it approachable for people to use it in their business, in their projects, whatever they want to use it. So congratulations on that part because Thank you're doing you. a perfect job. Uh, thanks a lot, Jerry. Yeah, it's good to be appreciated, and it's one of the reasons that I also <laughs> start the community. Because, you must think uh, <laughs> I think it's about really, you know, I'm really trying to help um, anyone and everyone understand data science and help uh, disseminate data science across uh, pretty much everywhere, you know, whether we're talking about society or the industry. Uh, so thank you again, and thanks, everyone. Um, this recording will also be available uh, sometime over the weekend or next week on the datascientist.com. Uh, if anyone uh, wants to get to be notified about this, make sure to visit the datascientist.com and uh, register to receive updates. Uh, so thanks everyone. And I uh, hope to see you again soon. Bye. And good Thank night. You. Bye -bye. Depending on your Bye -bye. time zone. It's not here, so good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Stelios. Bye.